A screenwriter is the only person involved in the creation of a movie that actually collaborates with literally everyone involved in the movie. Now, screenplays are not sacrosanct. If you know anything about the film industry, you know that if a review mentions a movie's script without that person having read it, what script are you talking about? Draft one, draft two, the shooting draft, draft three, the random one the director did. A script is a living document, but in it, it contains ideas and information. Those ideas and information are spread out to so many different artists who eventually create a movie that is in theory like the script. In that way, screenplays are very much like the mosquito trapped in amber from Jurassic Park. Like it has a bit of the information you need, but you kind of have to fill in the rest with millions and millions of dollars of technology and equipment. And of course, along the way, maybe you mix in some frog DNA, maybe, you know, corporate sabotage, maybe velociraptors end up eating all your friends. That's what being a screenwriter is. But in 2014, I didn't know that. You see, the beginning of my career, I was very lucky. And I was already lucky because I was raised in a filmmaking family. So my love language with my parents was movies. People often say that even when I talk, naturally, it occasionally sounds like I'm pitching. And that's because my whole childhood was listening to my mom and dad pitch. They're both sci-fi movie nuts. They're both cinephiles. And that was born in me from a very young age. But I didn't want to just direct movies. I wanted to write them. Although I didn't really know what being a screenwriter was. I, in my heart, had my eye on all these really big toys. Big toys. Spider-Man, right? Batman. Superman. I thought, Eventually, if I work my way up the ladder with original scripts, I'll be able to get in the good graces of these studio execs, and eventually I'll be able to get my hands on one of these properties that has defined pop culture, that defined my childhood, that led me to want to be a storyteller myself in some ways. Things inspire people. You can't deny that these big brands, Star Wars, The Matrix, Lord of the Rings, no matter what you say about the individual movies, they're connecting to people. And that's exciting, right? Even if they're just corporate products, even if it's just the 50th Marvel thing, it doesn't matter because within them are ideas that have connected to people emotionally. I was naive. And it's funny because I was selling a lot of scripts at the time and booking a lot of projects, but I didn't still really understand that most of the really big brands, those things are in-house. So what I mean by that is essentially that as a, an independent creator who's known for selling spec scripts of my original ideas, it was actually pretty hard for me to get in a room usually populated by people who had worked with the studio before, worked with the directors before, people you know, who are in that community of people who get to write those movies. The Marvel movies are written kind of by committee. There's a lot of individual creativity in them, but really, you know, they're a TV show. There's a plan. At the time, I was actually getting a reputation behind the scenes as being a pretty good writer. Chronicle had gotten me a lot of momentum, and even though Victor Frankenstein had sort of, you know how it is, I was still really hopeful and in a good position to maybe finally get my hands on some of those toys. That's where Mike DeLuca comes in. Mike DeLuca is a film executive, a job that's very hard to define often, who has great taste. If you Google him, you'll find all sorts of interesting movies he's worked on, stuff he's done. And I wanted to work with him basically from the moment I met him, which led to this weird, crazy thing happening in 2014 where Mike DeLuca called me into his office. He was like, do you have any ideas for Ghostbusters? This was the first time I was maybe in the running to really get one of these big properties. It was one of the most exciting moments maybe of my adult life. I mean, can you even imagine you get to write a Ghostbusters movie? The first Ghostbusters movie in like 20 years and it's you? I was like, I took this really seriously. This was the result of my hard work on many, many projects, not just the movies that got made, but I had finally been put into a position where I was in the room with one of these things I had hunted my entire life. And at the time, I was also making moves, kind of squirreling out Power Rangers. I had to pitch Chaim Saban for Lionsgate. But I liked Mike DeLuca. And Ghostbusters felt really real to me. It felt like something I could actually get. So I started to think about Ghostbusters. And one of the fucking crazy things about so many of these brands is that the feelings and ideas we associate with them aren't necessarily connected to the original project. In the original film, Ghostbusters, they bust one ghost. 
Our ideas about what Ghostbusters is have been changed and shaped by 30 years of media. You got the cartoon show where they're busting ghosts every week. You got the other cartoon show where they're sexy. You have all the toys. You have all the fan films. This has led to Ghostbusters feeling like something that it isn't, an action movie. If you've ever seen the first Ghostbusters, you know that it's a science fiction comedy with a thriller backstory that mainly lives off the character interactions. It has romance, it's sexy, it's silly, it's weird. It has multiple iconic individual scenes. Not to mention it's got a bunch of fucking great Saturday Night Live actors from the golden age filling out the cast. I mean like, Ghostbusters is a great movie but it's not a blockbuster by any modern definition, not at least until the last 15 minutes. Now, Ghostbusters 2 already had sort of a bad rap. A lot of people kind of pretend it doesn't exist. And it's because Ghostbusters 2 is not thematically involved with Ghostbusters 1. It doesn't show real progress in the world. A 300 foot tall marshmallow man tried to destroy New York and two years later, the guys who saved the world are the broke. The afterlife was definitively proven to They're exist. They're all doing birthday like parties. weird, it's weird. So I started to think about like, what would my Ghostbusters 3 actually be? I got really excited. I wrote up this long document and I pitched it. And it was such an exciting pitch because I was, it's called a warm pitch. When you're pitching to someone you already know and likes you, my God, the best feeling in the world because you can include details. And they were like, yeah, we think so. In the film industry, there are no guarantees. Anyone who promises you anything is either wrong, lying, stupid, or insane. Promises are hard to come by. So I got an email saying basically, yes, you got Ghostbusters. And I was like, it's my time and my dick fell off. Then about two weeks later, I was told I actually didn't have Ghostbusters. And the way I lost Ghostbusters was a director named Paul Feig, who's a comedy director, directed uh, Bridesmaids, a number of other films, very quirky, interesting guy. He had emailed the head of the studio and said, I think we should do Ghostbusters with all women. And it was just, you can read the email, it's available online. And they were like, yep, Paul Feig is such a bigger fish than me. I was just whoosh, into dust out the door. And it was funny because, you know, Mike said like, well, we'll work together eventually. But by that point, I had my eye on TV and I was already starting to sort of think about Dirk Gently and think about a world where I finally had more control and couldn't immediately have my dreams killed with a single email, right? Like, it's, it's a strange industry. The Ghostbusters all-female movie comes out. People have a, a reaction to it. I mean, four female Ghostbusters? The feminists are taking over. I'm an adult virgin. And they're like, we're gonna make another Ghostbusters movie. Jason Reitman, the son of the original director, Ivan Reitman, who's also directed a couple of films I really enjoy. He directed a movie I love called Up in the Air. He got the job uh, with Gil Keenan, who wrote Monster House. Gil Keenan is in Wrestling Isn't Wrestling. Everything is connected. Check the loss it found. Can't find my dick, cause it fell on the ground. And when the movie finally came out, a bunch of people hit me up to be like, hey, there's parts of your Ghostbusters pitch in Afterlife. The reason I feel comfortable talking about this right now is I don't think they really stole any of my ideas from my Ghostbusters 3 pitch, as you will soon see. But I think all of us have been in the position where you make a tweet and then you find out a bunch of people have already made that tweet and you're like, oh no, parallel thinking, what's happening? But I decided like, you know what? My Ghostbusters pitch is actually really, really, I think fun. And there's no reason for me not to share it, but I didn't want to do like this big thing where I like do a whole performance the way I do sometimes on YouTube. Hey, you little piece of shit, Bruce Wayne! I just want to share the pitch. So we're going to do this really informally. I have like a laptop I'm going to have near me because this is a pitch I haven't engaged with in eight years. Uh, let's see how much I can get off the dome. Okay guys, who are you going to call? We start in the 1920s and we watch this fat, sloppy guy named Marco work his way through the city doing errands for his boss, an industrialist named Evo Shandor. However, when arriving at the Shandor building, 550 Central Park West, 
a building you might recognize from the movie Ghostbusters. Marco accidentally finds himself interrupting an occult ritual. Ivo Shandor, a terrifying, strange man, picture in your head this guy, proclaims to his followers that before the end of the century, a terrifying demon will arrive. An entity called Gozer will come once, be defeated, only to arrive again 35 years later. Marco, hearing all of this, panics and tries to escape, only to be mobbed by cult members who drag him, yelling and struggling across the floor, bringing him on to an altar where his very soul is slowly sucked out of him and transmuted into ectoplasmic energy and holy shit, that Slimer! Cut to 1984, a black sky and a Buick floating in the air, a 79 Buick just floating until you realize it's flipping and then it falls and comes crashing down onto the street as an enormous marshmallow foot lands behind it. Boom, your car alarms go off. Police are grabbing people and shooting at a 300 foot tall mascot that has appeared from nowhere. People are seeing ghosts everywhere. Pictures are being taken and a monster is marching through the city destroying everything. But we're not on the top of the Shandor building, we're down with a kid named Ted Becker, who's only about seven years old. Separated from his parents, in this movie's first bone-rattling action sequence, a little kid runs through the finale confrontation of Ghostbusters on the street level. So we see the beams firing and all this crazy shit up there. For him, it's one of the most terrifying moments of his life, until it becomes one of the most inspiring moments of his life. And he is showered in marshmallow fluff. The Ghostbusters, to Ted, are something bigger than pest exterminators. They're something bigger even than scientists. The Ghostbusters to him are heroes. They're icons. Almost all of New York thinks of the four original Ghostbusters as having personally saved their lives. By the way, I should say, I'm not actually erasing Ghostbusters 2 here. I'm gonna use it as a bridge because I want them to go down and then back. And once the Statue of Liberty thing happens, it's undeniable. For his entire life, Ted wanted to be a Ghostbuster. It's why he studied quantum physics. But the company, Ghostbusters, in 2023 is a little bit different than it was in 1984. And I think it's time I explain that to you. You see, in the 1990s, going off, you know, the strength of defeating an interdimensional invader and saving the world, these four capitalists, the Ghostbusters, were able to franchise all over America. But I mean, you saw Ray, you saw Egon, Realistic, they were not. Being able to franchise at this level, a multi-billion dollar enterprise, led to them spending a lot of money in ways they didn't need to. Did the Atlanta chapter really need a helicopter? I mean, like, they had a cartoon show, they had toys, the Ghostbusters were on top of the world. The issue being, they had no ghosts to bust. Almost all of the spectral activity in the first Ghostbusters was actually caused by the imminent arrival of Gozer. So once they defeated Gozer and they got rid of that painting of Vigo, the issue is, is that if you have an entire franchise based around we saved the world from ghosts and then there's no more ghosts, the question becomes, uh, what do you do with the franchise? And the answer is the people who used to work at the various firehouses all over America, a lot of them never even got to bust one ghost and essentially got a whole chapter of their life taken from them and are now retired or laughing stocks. There are only two Ghostbusters houses remaining open, New York and LA. Now, keep in mind, there hasn't been a legitimate call to the New York house in more than 10 years. There have been one or two ectoplasmic entities that showed up. There's not zero ghosts, there's just not enough to sustain a national company. The uh, issue is the thinking around ghosts has changed. Egon Spengler's research into the things they were busting eventually led to a commonly accepted theory that the ghosts in Ghostbusters are not representative of individual human identities. They are not your soul. They are just a sort of impression left by your energy. Now, needless to say, a lot of people took that to mean all of our religions can still be right because these aren't even technically dead people. 
which meant that in hindsight, the accomplishments of the Ghostbusters were steadily minimized and minimized and minimized and minimized until the Ghostbusters Firehouse in New York is basically a stop on a sightseeing tour and not much else. When you look at what happened to the original guys, that kind of makes sense. Venkman retired almost immediately after the events of Ghostbusters 2 as a multi-billionaire and has not been seen since. Egon Spangler, while experimenting with ectoplasmic energies, accidentally converted himself into ectoplasm and ascended to a higher plane of existence. So, <laughs> Egon's gone. Winston Zedmore, who was an official employee by the second Ghostbusters, ended up being a prime shareholder. That means when the company went public, Winston became a billionaire, which led to him investing very, very smartly throughout the 90s, not really doing Ghostbusters stuff, and eventually becoming the 152nd richest man alive. That left Ray Stance. Uh, Ray now wears an eye patch, not, not from a ghost, he got it with a fork, he doesn't want to explain. And Ray Stance, you know, I don't know if you've seen Ghostbusters, but he's not the best businessman. So he's essentially run the company into the ground. That said, there is an active roster of Ghostbusters at the New York house, just in case, to justify them all still keeping their insurance. You have Ted Becker, who's a physicist and a parapsychologist and an earnest, kind sweetheart who's wanted to be a Ghostbuster his whole life. You have Veronica Spangler, the daughter of Egon Spangler, now an adult, who has a very complicated relationship with the hole her father left in her life when he blipped out of existence when she was six. She kinda loves Egon and she's kinda just like Egon, but she kinda hates Egon and she's kinda nothing like Egon. I'm thinking someone who's like actively the whole movie fighting against being Egon. Then you have Brian Quaid, a self-proclaimed psychic who they always put out kind of in front of the team as a mascot because he's good looking, fast talking, laid back and even if he seems maybe kind of like he's full of shit, so is Vankman. So the last member of the team is Erwin Oberstein. Erwin doesn't care about ghosts. He's not there to bust ghosts. He's not there to save the world. He doesn't care about the paranormal. All Erwin wants to do is play with the toys. He is a physicist who was kicked out of MIT for blowing up part of MIT. No one was hurt, but ever since he did that, every single company in the world has been scouting this guy to come work with them. He's a hot property, but all he wanted to do was work with the Ghostbusters. Now, if you think being broke and having no sense of purpose and essentially living in a Ghostbusters cosplay is a depressing existence for the New York team? Wait till I tell you what's happening outside of the building. You see a group called the Free Spirits, which is this mainly online sort of Twitter thing that exploded and led to real protests, is saying that keeping the ghosts in the basement is slavery. They're basically saying that the Ghostbusters are criminal and what they've done to ghosts for the last 30 something years is technically a human rights violation. The fact that the ghosts themselves individually have been proven to not be representative of human consciousness doesn't really mean anything to the free spirits. They're mad, they want all the ghosts to be free, and they're gonna yell all night and all day and live stream the Ghostbusters whenever they exit the thing and yell, monsters, fascists! And you know, these Ghostbusters are like the sweetest, like nicest people and they're having stuff thrown at them. And you know, one woman screams, Let my grandmother out of there, you son of a bitch! And Ted is like, I don't know how to do that. That's when Winston Zedmore shows up. Now, Winston Zedmore, again, as I said, is one of the richest men in the world, and he's approached Ray Stance to sort of liquidate the Ghostbusters multiple, multiple times. All of this technology, even though the company is private, is still owned by Ray and Egon, so they haven't been able to sell any of it or repurpose it towards the greater good, and that's led to sort of tech industry resentment against the Ghostbusters, which is leading to resentment against Winston Zedmore. So now he's arrived to talk to Ted. He says, Ted, convince Ray, liquidate the Ghostbusters, it's over. Now Ted's like Ray's apprentice, he loves Ray. He thinks Ray is a genius, even though Ray is clearly insane. Ted basically like gives Winston Zedmore the speech from the 80s movie where he's gonna save the community center. And he's like, I believe in the Ghostbusters. And Winston's like, it's just a job, kid. And Ted's like, well, I'm a, I am a Ghostbusters. Don't change the Ghostbusters. I love the Ghostbusters. I'm an adult virgin. I came up with that before I knew what was gonna be the reaction to the all-female Ghostbusters. But now it sounds like, but I did. I did. There's a character in this movie whose argument is, don't change the Ghostbusters. 
but even like seconds after Ted gives this speech to Winston, he already literally regrets it because we see what his life is like. I mean, his fiance seems like she's gonna leave him soon because his main job is giving people tours of the Ghostbusters firehouse. His parents basically thought he was gonna be this famous physicist and instead he's giving people tours of the Ghostbusters firehouse and that is his entire job. Erwin keeps being approached by these like douchebag scouts from tech companies who basically are like, why the fuck are you getting paid beans to work with the Ghostbusters when you can make millions with us? So Erwin is just sort of giving Ted a little push to be like, hey Ted, could I, you know, experiment with the proton packs a little, take them up a couple degrees, really take us to Mount Olympus? And Ted is like, no, absolutely not. Don't change anything. Everything's fine. Just leave it the way it is. We're the Ghostbusters. Why are you trying to be more than that? And Irwin, who has like five offers on the table, each over $4 million, is like, okay, cool, man, cool. Inner team strife. Now, New York obviously has it bad, but the LA team is the only one still making money, and that's because they have successfully transitioned in the last six years into influencers. So remember the whole era of like, the sort of rise of Neil deGrasse Tyson, like, I fucking love science. I'm a, I like video game, but I am a girl. Hot? The Ghostbusters LA chapter has never busted a ghost. The two main Ghostbusters over there are both doctoral degree guys who are mainly charismatic entertainers. They talk about ghosts because it's their brand. The woman is actually interesting. She's been swapped out like six times, each time for a younger woman. This new girl who's on the LA team, it's actually very, very hard for her because she joined to bust ghosts, not be an influencer. She was already an influencer. And as the newest member of a Ghostbusters team, she thought they were gonna be heroes. And now their marketing manager is like, can you post a thirst trap with a proton pack? She's like, no. At this sick party in the Hollywood Hills, the LA team is approached by a man named John Reiser, who says he's part of the Moebius Initiative. The Moebius Initiative has a very simple goal, although stated a bit complexly. The capture, reformatting, indoctrination, and acetizing of ectoplasmic energies. You heard all those words right. These motherfuckers want to weaponize ghosts. The Moebius Initiative is technically a branch of the United States government, so it would be a federal buyout. The LA Busters need money. They're fine with this. They're like, okay, here's our equipment. We'll do whatever you want. Don't tell Ray Stance. But then John Reiser says, no, there's no way. This equipment has never been used. We need a government sanctioned test run of this. The problem is no ghosts. The LA Busters take their tricked out Dodge Challenger fucking ghost mobile and they go to New York to talk to the NYC team. The idea is, can you loan us a ghost from the containment unit so that we can demo out our equipment and stop being Ghostbusters? As financial and emotional pressures continue to mount on the New York team, things are especially hard for Ray Stance. Now you have to understand, Ray is a brilliant guy, but he doesn't have the ideas or the ambition to move the Ghostbusters forward to where they need to be. Instead, he's sort of trapped in the past, lost in nostalgia, forever staring at a photograph of himself and the other Ghostbusters on his desk, all of them covered in marshmallow fluff. He misses Egon. He's out of touch with the world. And he doesn't understand why people hate the Ghostbusters. What's worse for Ray is that he really has no connection to Veronica Spangler. She doesn't like him and thinks he's weird, even though she's weird. For Ray, that breaks his heart because she's his only connection to his best friend, a person he lost in a way that he never suspected could ever happen. Veronica and Ray get into basically a yelling father-daughter nerd fight, which ends with her literally storming out and slamming the door. This is a 30-something year old woman. And she goes out into the street where she is approached by the friendly, charismatic, and charming Dante, a front man for the group, the Free Spirits. Now, as soon as they meet, they have insane chemistry and they have this whirlwind sort of date walk around New York. That insane chemistry though, we learn from audience exclusive information that Dante is actually maybe just doing this for the free spirits because they intend to open up the containment unit and get inside the firehouse because they want to end the slavery of these beings. Eco-terrorism, fuck that shit, that's yesterday. Ecto-terrorism. Them walking around New York together, Dante and Veronica, actually goes into this fun, almost before sunrise vibe. 
we get a little bit of a better look into who Veronica Spangler is. Even though Veronica Spangler claims to have no interest in what happened to her father, clearly resents him for his abrupt disappearance, not only from her life, but from the entire world, every night she listens to white noise. She sits and waits and listens and hopes for a message. She tunes devices and radiometers and spectrometers and waits and waits because he didn't die. He ascended. And isn't there a chance? I mean, isn't there just a sliver of hope? Now, in all this time listening to White Noise, Veronica has heard one thing. It was her name, Veronica. But it ended up just being an overheard part of a mattress commercial. And she wonders, she doesn't know what's worse, that he's gone forever or that he's there but he doesn't care. This leads to this incredible connection, Veronica thinks, between her and Dante, and they end on a kiss. And that's Spangler's first kiss, you know, in a while. But for Dante, it's weird because he sort of thought she would be like corporate scum. Instead, it's this like sad, vulnerable person who just misses their father and wants to connect with the afterlife in the same way he does. Ooh, lots of plots getting set up, having lots of fun in the Ghostbusters universe. That night, Quaid, the psychic, has a terrifying prophetic dream. He sees Slimer, who speaks in a strange, deep voice. That's right, Slimer talks. It's really weird and dreamlike and not okay. And Slimer says, he's coming, and then opens a doorway to reveal a massive human bloodshot eye looking in with seven writhing snakes coming out of the tear ducts. When Quaid wakes up from the screaming, the rest of the team kind of like, what, what just happened? This gives Veronica a chance to kind of sneak back in. Quaid is usually a joker, so even though he's really rattled by this dream, the rest of the team blows him off. And by the way, it's too late anyway, because here comes the LA team to ask for a ghost that morning. You have to keep in mind, when the LA team shows up, they're hot, the New York team is not. They represent very different things. Veronica still has Dante's sort of rhetoric in her mind about ghosts being living things and you can't just sort of treat them like objects. So she kind of spearheads the rebuttal of, no, we're not gonna fucking loan you a ghost. And a friendly conversation between the two last Ghostbusters teams on the planet devolves into yelling and throwing food at each other. Things are getting worse and worse. Everybody's tearing each other apart verbally. Ray literally just goes into his office and closes the door and puts his head on the desk when they are interrupted by a phone call on the red phone. Janine still works there. She answers the phone and she can't believe it. It's a ghost. The NYC team is like giddy as all fuck and they basically bail in the middle of the fight with the LA team. They're gonna get to bust a ghost. But the LA team has a different plan and they leave to go fulfill their own agenda. Now we enter our first full-on Ghostbusters action sequence. And keep in mind, if you've watched the other movies, this is actually technically like, after Ghostbusters 2, it would have been the first ever big Ghostbuster action sequence that's played for excitement and thrills rather than laughs and spectacle. It starts in a parking structure where someone has drawn the layout of a Ouija board, but they've spray painted it huge. And a shopping cart has been used as a planchette to summon this crazy ghost that's like got this super long noodle body. It almost looks like a Chinese dragon, but with a human face. And of course, this is their first time ever busting ghosts. So all four members of the team fuck up horribly. Oberstein's overclocked equipment is almost out of control. They're fucking causing millions of dollars in collateral damage. Thank God they're still insured from the 80s. Because this is their first time out, it is a total shit show. First of all, it turns out Quaid really is psychic, except for that means whenever the ghost approaches him, he gets overwhelmed by terrifying visions can't really operate the proton pack. Second of all, the fucking proton packs have been tuned up by Oberstein to the degree that when you pull the trigger on them, you go like like that. Veronica Spangler even fucks up. She misidentifies what type of ghost this thing is. That leads to civilians being put in danger as the Ecto-1 chases this ghost through the active New York subway, almost being hit by trains as this thing is weaving around and they're fucking firing at it and blowing past subway platforms. It's nuts. Finally, they end up crashing through the bottom of a Broadway theater in the middle of a huge show. And guess what? After all that shit, the Ghostbusters bust the ghost, and then they get fucked 
up. You have to understand, this was their dream. And it doesn't matter that it was a total shit show. It doesn't. They did it. They caught a ghost. They all end up getting drunk and getting a little stoned and spending time together on the roof of the firehouse where they built a fire pit. We learn a little more about each character and their reasons for becoming a Ghostbuster. This moment kind of peaks when we learn a little bit more about Quaid and his psychic abilities, which everyone now realizes are real. Quaid, when he was a little kid, was raised by this old lady in his apartment building. His parents were absentee parents, and eventually one night they didn't come home at all. And he ended up staying in that old lady's apartment. About five years later, one of her grandchildren came to visit. Except for her grandchild was 81 years old. That old lady had been dead since 1919. You heard that right. One of the new Ghostbusters was literally raised by a ghost. So they're bonding, they're coming together, the actors are ad-libbing. Ominous music cue. At the Shander building, long abandoned but not yet demolished, the LA team has arrived. You see, they have their own plan. They're gonna use the Shandor buildings, let's just call them unique architectural properties, in order to summon a small, harmless ghost and then bust it for the Moebius Initiative and get that money, baby! They go up to the roof, they begin a ritual, and their plan works. Flawlessly, a little cute ghost comes through a rift in reality. Claw grabs it, boom, into the rift. It's Vince Clortho and Zool. Uh, for those of you not caught up on the Ghostbusters mythology, those are the big cat dog sweeties who jump in you and make you want to fuck. Now the two LA male Ghostbusters who've been on the team forever run. They don't even fire their proton packs. But the girl, who's a new member of the team and is ready to fucking prove herself, attempts to stop Vince Clortho and Zool and gets possessed. Hello, gatekeeper. Meanwhile, Quaid and Spangler, Veronica, not Egon, discuss the new ghost. They end up researching it and discovering that this ghost is not just some random spirit. It's a harbinger, almost like a remora fish, a, a symbiote for a larger entity. When they begin to research it, they discover that this entity is called Tiamat. And then they find a reference to Gozer. It turns out years ago, when Egon was first researching Gozer with Ray, they mistranslated the ancient texts. Gozer isn't its own creature. Gozer is just the harbinger of Tiamat, a world-ending entity. Gozer was always supposed to be defeated. Tiamat cannot be stopped. While they're in the middle of discovering this potentially world-ending piece of information, Dante shows up looking for Veronica, thinking like, let's go on a date again. But Veronica, who's just dealt with a real ghost and experienced real danger and now actually feels like a real Ghostbuster. The real Ghostbusters. She has no time for any of Dante's bullshit. So she basically is like, Dante, you don't know what you're talking about. These are demons. Literally the free spirits are full of shit. Get out of here. And Dante's pissed off because he thought they had a real connection. And Veronica did too, but it's a movie. So there's conflict. Ray comes out of his office finally and essentially just kicks Dante the fuck out. You see, they have a real problem. In the last 24 hours, there's been a surge of anomalous activity all over New York City. It's about then when the Moebius Initiative shows up led, of course, by John Reiser. The initiative, armed not with proton packs, but with guns and tasers, detains the entire Ghostbusters team. You see, they think it's more than a little convenient that right when they asked the LA team for a ghost, suddenly the New York team had a ghost? Seems a little iffy. They suspect that ghost that they just busted was let out from the containment unit. Now, we know it wasn't, but it is a little coincidental, right? Veronica had already stormed off during her argument with Dante. And when the Moebius Initiative showed up, she just climbed out the window. She doesn't want to go with these weird government freaks. So Veronica escapes out the window into the streets of New York City. The rest of the team are detained and the firehouse is now empty and unprotected. And that's a perfect opportunity for Dante and the free spirits. Janine is actually still there. She catches Dante and tries to knock him out with a wine bottle, but he charms it out of her hands and then locks her in a cabinet. But once he's down there with the containment unit, Dante sees all of Veronica's listening devices, the things she used to try to connect to her father. And he has second thoughts. Is freeing these ghosts really the right thing to do? What if Veronica's right? What if it's dangerous? His personal connection to her is making him second guess his ideology. But none of that matters because Vince Clortho jumps on him from behind! We got a key master, baby! And they're both so hot. As soon as Dante is possessed, he 
freeze the ghosts, and we've got bump, ba, da, da, bump, bump. I believe it's magic. I believe it's magic. Now, I just want to say something. I've put a Mick Smiley, I believe it's magic moment in so many of the things I've written. And when I was trying to think of this in the pitch, I got like physically excited. This is that moment where it's like, except for it's even more complicated because now instead of a capitalism beat like the first Ghostbusters, it's an emotional beat because Veronica sees Dante escaping the exploding firehouse and assumes he was the one who freed the ghosts. Oh shit, but it's a movie, so there's conflict. Veronica is pissed off, awesome sequence. She goes back into the firehouse as it's erupting, vomiting out hundreds of ghosts, gets a proton pack, fights off a bunch of ghosts and saves Janine, but in the process really fucks up the firehouse. With all of the technology in the firehouse sparking, coming apart, lighting on fire as ghosts explode through the windows, walls and ceiling, Veronica lets out one last frantic cry on the all units message to everyone who's ever been a Ghostbuster, to every house, help. Who knows if it even got out? It's way too late. All those proton beams she was firing around and the ghosts crashing into shit, it's a little too much for infrastructure from the 1940s. The entire firehouse crumbles to the ground and Veronica and Janine barely get out. Oh no, you destroyed the Ghostbusters firehouse. All these reboots and brand movies, haven't you noticed how many of them are about maintaining the status quo and showing you the same thing in different ways again and again? It's Luke, but now it's a girl. It's Darth Vader, but now he's really hot. I mean, like they sort of... <laughs> I'm, no one thinks I'm funnier than I do. As wild escaping ghosts cause pandemonium all over New York City, this offers a unique opportunity for the New York Busters to escape the Moebius Initiative's custody as they're being attacked and picked up by ghosts and the Busters just run into the street and drag Ray along with them. They use quick thinking and also a little bit of Quaid's psychic abilities to get the Ecto-1 out of the impound and use the onboard tracker in the Ecto-1 to find the Ecto X, the Ecto X being the super tricked out ghost mobile that the LA team drives. Now Becker, Oberstein and Quaid are all enraged. There's a lot of masculine energy going on right now with the LA team fucked us over deal, but Ray is just heartbroken. The Ghostbusters are supposed to help people, to protect people, to advance science. And now one of the Ghostbusters teams has literally possibly triggered a ghost apocalypse. Ray has lost all his friends. He's lost his eye. He's lost his company. He's broken. Becker tries his best to use his sweet, earnest nature to pep talk Ray into joining them to stopping this before it goes too far. But even his pep talk is interrupted by a call from his fiance. New York is being evacuated. And if he doesn't come with her, maybe they're not gonna stay together. Now is not the time to be a Ghostbuster. To which he responds, now is exactly the time to be a Ghostbuster. And she hangs up on him. Uh-oh. Meanwhile, Dante, the key master, meets up with the female buster from LA, the gatekeeper, and um... I'm an adult. Meanwhile, Becker and the boys catch up with the LA team, which leads to probably a big piece of the trailer of this movie, which is the Ecto-1 in a car chase with the Ecto-X through New York City as ghosts are going everywhere. Finally, they managed to fucking woo, fucking ditch the fucking LA team's car into the fucking side of the road. A lot of F-bombs there, I'm sorry. This movie's rated PG-13, but I as a person am rated R. They confront the LA busters at Proton Pack Point. All your Instagram followers can't save you now, and they confirm their worst suspicions. But any further fighting with the LA busters is cut off because Boom! Giant beam of energy up to the sky from the center of New York. That's right, the gatekeeper and the key master be fucking. The gate has been keyed, so to speak, if you get my meaning. Veronica, who's alone and believes the rest of the team has been arrested, sees this giant pillar of light from the Shandor building and realizes, holy shit, it's 1984 all over again, and I have to do this by myself. This woman's a spangler. She zips up the jumpsuit, charges up the proton pack, says goodbye to Janine, and begins a slow march through a Manhattan which is being washed under a tidal wave of spectral anarchy. 
the feminists are taking over. Ray, in the meantime, sees the giant beam of light into the sky. He's flashing back to the 80s, and he ends up at the firehouse and discovers it destroyed. Ray has been living in the past, and now he's truly lost everything. He was a hero. They were all heroes, and now what? They brought about the end of the world? Everyone always told Ray Stantz he was crazy. And 40 years and $10 billion later, it looks like they were right. He finds that picture of him and the other busters from when they first stopped Gozer. Shattered now, torn in half. Some of it's been burned away. For the first time in years, he takes out his cell phone and he calls Peter Venkman. We cut to Bill Murray, who's on a beach, <laughs> in, on a tropical island, and he's sitting, he's got a big tiki drink, shirtless, just sunning himself, and his phone starts ringing. Sigourney Weaver walks out of the water. She's with their grandkids and their kids. They're having fun. Venkman's sitting, and he looks at his phone, and it's Ray Stance, and he goes, forwards. <laughs> That's, that's the only time Bill Murray is in this movie. Ray sits there alone, listening to screams and ghostly chaos. Becker, Oberstein, and Quaid arrive. Except for the thing is, they're in exactly the same state Ray is. Becker probably has lost his fiance, and his desire to be a Ghostbuster has led him to a front row seat at the end of the world. Oberstein didn't even have to be here, and all of his souped up technology, it turns out, doesn't mean much in the face of an extra-dimensional god. And as for Quaid, Quaid his whole life has been trying to prove that he's psychic. And he proves it right before the end of the world. I think in story terms, they call this a all hope is lost moment. They have failed. And the entire world, if not the entire universe, will suffer under the weight of their failure. Meanwhile, in an embattled city hall, an intern rushes through paramedics and cops trying to get to the mayor. You see, a helicopter has requested emergency access to the city's airspace. When the intern finally gets to the mayor, he finds him unusually calm. In fact, the mayor is handling this crisis really well because the mayor is Walter Peck. He's been through all this shit before. He gets the helicopter's clearance code and immediately grants it access to New York's airspace. Then he asks his interns and his tech guys to broadcast something out over all of the New York federal channels, a text message over the emergency alert system that will go to every single resident of New York. The defeated Ghostbusters are again confronted by the Moebius Initiative, about to arrest them a second time, and this time they just want to go peacefully. They're done. John Reiser, clearly blames them for what's happening. They're probably the only people who could stop this, and they're not going anywhere. And then we hear the sound of a helicopter. Ghostbusters branded vehicles, let's sell those toys, baby. We got a VW bus and a fucking Tesla. Multiple different cars swerve up to the firehouse all of them with the Ghostbusters branding. These are all the vehicles that were decommissioned from all over America, baby. How did they get here? Well, look up. That's a Chinook helicopter with Ghostbusters branding. It's the Atlanta helicopter. I foreshadowed that because I want it in the movie. Back off, Morbius Initiative. It's motherfucking Winston Zedmore. He heard Veronica's call because he thought it would be Ray calling him to finally give over the technology. But it wasn't. It said help. So Winston used his massive resources to fly in basically every decommissioned Ghostbuster from the entire East Coast. And now we're looking at a Ghostbuster team of maybe 15 people. Holy shit, it's the Avengers of comedy in 2022. Basically we tell all of the talent agencies in LA, hey, do any of your clients want to be in a Ghostbusters movie? And the people who want it the most are in the movie. And that's world building, because then all of these funny, fun characters who will be used, I'm not going to talk about them much, because they'll mainly be used for comic relief and back up to the emotional stories of the leads. Except for, aren't you curious in seeing a, uh, a separate Ghostbusters movie starring Key and Peele? Couldn't I maybe interest you in a Ghostbusters series with Pete Davidson in it? I mean, you see what I'm saying? This is how you do the spin-offs and all the fucking streaming series, is you just be like, 
Yeah, there's actually a bunch of Ghostbusters, and of course there are, because Ghostbusters has been around forever. The Moebius Initiative scatters. They don't want to fuck with the Ghostbusters. And Ray and Winston revisit their conversation about revelations from the first Ghostbusters. Well, I guess we finally made it. I didn't think the world would end when we were so old. Saving the world's a young man's game. And Ray gets up and goes, well, technically even after we're dead, we're still on the hook. And the Ghostbusters roll out. And I think you know what song is playing when the caravan of Ghostbusters vehicles starts to head towards the Shandor building. Let's go. <laughs> Veronica Spangler, alone on foot, walks up the street towards Park West. She can hear the faint sounds of ghosts chasing people, but New York is, for lack of a better term right now, a ghost town. Yeah. It seems entirely abandoned. And then she starts to hear music. And as she turns onto the street, holy fuck, it's like 10,000 people. Like they're waiting for a parade. Speakers have been hastily set up and they're blasting happy, positive music. There's so much positive energy in this area. She's totally confused. How is this possible? She sees Walter Peck standing on top of a cop car. What the hell? He's yelling, yeah, come on, into a megaphone and stirring up the crowd. Come on, New York! And then she hears, whoop, and from behind her, the Ecto-1 pulls up. Becker pulls her onto the Ecto-1. The full team is reunited. All four Ghostbusters, plus Ray, plus Winston, plus 15 other people. This is sick. Let's get Ella Henderson's ghost playing over these speakers. I keep going to the river to pray. The amount of positive energy is surging. Becker's confused, but then Ray realizes what's happening because he sees Walter Peck. Holy shit. Peck remembers from fucking Ghostbusters 1 and 2. Having a bunch of people being positive and cheering you on actually creates positive magic. And as the Ghostbusters arrive to a parade, we're back in fucking Ghostbusters 1, but way better because there's a zillion ghosts flying all over the place right over all of the people, but they can't quite come down because everyone's having too much fun. Come on, Ghostbusters is a little bit of a kid's movie. Let's have a little bit of a fun with the vibes, you know? have a little magic in this movie, a little good feels for this moment before kind of things get complicated in a second. I want to sneak a bunch of character beats in here because as they're driving up to the building, there's this giant building, giant pillar of like fiery light coming out of the top of it. Erwin Oberstein sees in the crowd the douchey tech bros who were like, quit the Ghostbusters, come work with us. Except for now, he's literally standing on top of the Ecto-1 in a full Ghostbusters uniform. So these douchey tech bro scouts are like, I want to take you behind the scenes here for a second because the thinking here, I just wanted to tell you, yeah, we're back at the Shandor building and yeah, we're essentially in a much bigger version of the finale from Ghostbusters 1. Now, of course, because we want it to be different, it's going to play out in a completely different way. But I think, I'm a Return of the Jedi guy. I think the final act of Return of the Jedi was the perfect way to end Star Wars, including the Ewoks. And... I wanna do Return of the Jedi right now. So yeah, we're going back up to the boss fight from the first movie, except for now it's way bigger, way crazier. There's way more people we like there and there's no guarantee we win. Becker, who's on his car, gets out in front of the building as they're all parking and people are cheering and dancing, but also terrified. And then he sees in the crowd, his fiance. He goes to her and says, you didn't leave. And she goes, we all got this text, look. They all got the text from Walter Peck, the mayor, for the emergency alert system. The text says, come to Park West right now to support the Ghostbusters and save the world. Now, not all of New York showed up, but if your fiance was going to be there and you were thinking about evacuating the city, and then you got a text from the mayor after you were mean to your fiance on the phone, she's like, I love you. I'm proud of you. And he goes, I'm proud of me too. Isn't this nuts? Yeah, listen. Listen, I know everybody's having fun, but please, please save the world. And Becker goes, okay, uh, we're like six out of 10. Definitely we're gonna save the world. And she goes, six? Meanwhile, Walter Peck and Ray and Winston lock eyes through the crowd. And Walter Peck, you know, he has like 10 lines in this movie, but he has a great moment. He just goes, and Ray and Winston both go, oh!
Peck starts laughing because by this point, these guys have known each other for 40 years. But the bubble of positive energy is starting to break. The ghosts are starting to descend and all of our cameo Ghostbusters are occupied using their unique ghost busting devices, which come on production design, let's make toys. Their unique ghost busting devices to fight off the ghosts that are swooping at the crowd. Our five main Ghostbusters, that's Quaid, Becker, Oberstein, Spangler, Stance, Ray, are like, how do we get to the roof? Ray just says, not the stairs. Y'all, y'all, remember Ghostbusters? Remember Ghostbusters when they, they have to go up the stairs? Something way better happens, which is that the helicopter lowers a platform on chains and all five of them stand on the platform and the helicopter goes like that. So they have to go, whoa! And there's this incredible image of the Ghostbusters being lifted into the air, their proton packs sparkling like Christmas lights as the entire crowd watches them rise up, up, up. Ray notices that Veronica is basically like, clutching the thing and staring and her eyes wide as they go higher. Ray takes his hand and he puts it on her shoulder. And he says, you know he'd be proud of you right now. And Veronica in this moment, really for the first time, connects the fact that this man wasn't just in the Ghostbusters with her father. This was her father's best friend who is processing his loss as well. And she has been a dick to him for her entire life. And Veronica looks into Ray's remaining eye and says, he'd be proud of you too, Ray. And Dan Aykroyd just gives a great face because they get to the top of the building and they briefly have to fight with Vince Clortho and Zool, but you also have to keep in mind, it's been years since Ghostbusters 1. This building has been abandoned forever. So the whole roof, basically the whole set from Ghostbusters 1 is now concave. It's like fallen into itself. So there's multiple levels of the interior of the building visible from this crater in the top of it. It's a cool place for a final action sequence. Just picture it in your head. Just do some of the work. Do you see me sweating? Though they're able to fight off Zool and Vince Clortho, a tornado of ghosts is beginning to encircle the building. So there's hundreds of spirits flying past like they're on the inside of a cyclone, but none of them are even attacking and the building is starting to shake. Quaid, who's separated from the group briefly in the fight with Vince Clortho, sees Slimer and he remembers his dream and goes, you! And Slimer, amid all of the ghosts moving at thousands of miles an hour around this building, Slimer turns like Bleep. Once Quaid is separate with Slimer, the remaining group is trying to fight off the ghosts when they realize they're surrounded by human cultists. There are living people here. It's the Moibius Initiative. They're not affiliated with the United States government. Holy fucking shit. They are Shandor cultists. This whole thing was a trick. These fuckers intentionally manipulated the Ghostbusters' desperation to bring about the end of the world. They all got played, right as it looks like all hope is lost. <laughs> Blasts of protonic energy send them scrambling. Holy shit, it's the fucking LA Ghostbusters. They actually showed up. They have come back to set right what they once put wrong. These celebrity pseudoscientist assholes are about to put their money where their mouth is. Their interference causes the ghosts to sort of get all disoriented and start attacking the cultists. Now it's total anarchy on the roof. The temple structure on the side of the building completely falls off. So now the whole top of the building is just an open wound. Maybe the apocalypse will be averted. I'm just kidding. Gozer's here! And he, she, they look as sexy as ever, and I'm okay with feeling that way. Choose the form of your destruction. You know, the speech from the first Ghostbusters. Becker yells out, everybody think of something harmless! And then Ray goes, no, don't! Thinking of something harmless can actually be very dangerous. Everybody think about toilet paper! Everybody stands around like idiots for a second in the heart of a storm of ghosts in basically the end of the world like this. Toilet paper, toilet paper, toilet paper, toilet paper. And guess what? It fucking works. Gozer turns into a roll of toilet paper and it goes and lands on the floor. And Ted Becker goes, blast it with the proton pack, it's incinerated. He goes, Toilet paper situation handled, guys. Gozer is defeated, except for the explosion of the toilet paper leaves a rift in space-time and all of the ghosts begin to be sucked towards it. Gozer was the herald, remember? Killing Gozer 
brings Tiamat. Everything starts to shake. Radiation levels start rapidly rising and then pfft, EMP, their packs are fried, they're fucked. The little rip in reality rockets up into the sky and then blows apart 11 miles wide, revealing a gigantic eye peering down over the island of Manhattan. You have never seen a monster this big in a live action movie ever. Like remember in the first Ghostbusters, it's like it's the end of the world. And then it's like a kind of a hot, asexual, like sort of ambiguous chick and two dogs. Well, no, this is the end of the world. The eye is so big, we see a wide of Manhattan and it's just a giant eye. Wow. Up on the remnants of the temple, separate from the group, Quaid is in awe. He's climbed out onto this embankment, the sort of ruins that go out that are covered in runes. Slimers indicating the runes. This is how you stop it. We're paying off the opening sequence. And yeah, did I do enough Slimer stuff during this version of the pitch? No, I didn't. Is it not perfectly foreshadowed? Yeah, in this version, but in the movie we would see the runes in a book in the production design and you would be like, oh, that's how you do the runes in Slimer and Quaid. Okay, you get it, okay? Just trust me. Slimer shows Quaid, if we destroy these runes, we can close the gate. Slimer doesn't talk, he just indicates this through pantomime. Right as Quaid begins to deactivate the gate by destroying the runes, bang! Pistol shot! He's shot through the back by motherfucking John Riser. Quaid falls down covered in his own blood and in shock as the world is beginning to end around him, and then looks up at John Riser, and his gift allows him to see through the illusion. This is motherfucking Ivo Shandor. And yeah, J.K. Simmons, you were in the fucking new one for like a couple of seconds. Well, you, you're also in this one. So J.K. Simmons, I know you're a longtime follower of this YouTube channel. And I just want to say <laughs> Now we're literally in the Return of the Jedi third act structure. We have the space battle of the second Death Star, except for that is all of our cameo Ghostbusters fighting all these ghosts down there and saving people. And then we have Han and Leia and the Ewoks, and that is our main team of Ghostbusters. How the fuck are they going to stop this without proton packs? But Spangler confirms that if Tiamat gets so much as a millimeter into our reality, it will cause permanent problems and more than a millimeter, probably the end of the world. Ray realizes crossing the streams would not be enough to close a gate that big. And then Oberstein, the physicist, figures out there needs to be a protonic reaction inside the gate. The gate is the thing with all the runes on it that Gozer was standing on top of in the first Ghostbusters. Some of it fell off the building, but now Quaid's on top of it. I'm just trying to get the geography clear in your head. Ray agrees. If they can get the packs working again, he will detonate his inside the gate. Veronica is horrified, but you'll die. And this line of dialogue I actually have written down, so I'd like to read it to you because I think it's a good Ray line. What? Die? Not a chance. The explosion of the pack in that catalytic of an energy cocktail will convert me to atoms electron by electron and blast me across the entire universe in a superheated wave of energy. To say I'd die would be a terrible understatement. It'll be great! They get to their packs because the ghosts are distracted because they're all being sucked up into Tiamat who is slowly beginning to lower towards our reality. Marvel's The Avengers style except for way crazier looking. But the packs are not working. Riser does this incredible villain laugh with an epic drone <laughs> shot from the top of the temple with Quaid at his feet. Veronica, holding her pack, shakes it and says, no, please, please, I need you. I need you now. There's a burst of static. White noise plays on their walkie-talkies. And one word. Veronica. It wasn't a fucking mattress commercial. All of the proton packs turn back on! Egon just nudged them from the other side. Oh my god, the afterlife is real! Emotions, emotions, I'm crying, you're crying. Tiamat screams in anger because he can sense that the proton packs are reactivated and Ted cuts him off, pointing at the sky. Hey, shut up! I'm not afraid of you, you stupid... God, you want to come in our house and take a shit on our floor? Nobody shits on our floor! Oberstein, show me Mount Olympus! Uh, if you remember in the first act, Oberstein said he wanted to overcharge the packs 
to the point that it was like Mount Olympus, and that was foreshadowing for this mo- that was CRAZY! The packs explode with proton streams so bright, they light up the entire night sky over New York City. It looks like daylight from this much energy spraying into this eye, and of course the eye is like, Riser, realizing what's happening, screams in anger and draws his gun, aiming at the Ghostbusters below him, only for Slimer to fly through him from behind and slime this motherfucker, just like Bankman in Ghostbusters 1. A little bit of irony there, because if you remember the beginning of this movie, Shandor's the one who killed Slimer. Well, surprise, Shandor. Quaid stands up and shoulders this dude off the side of the building. That's a lot of flights. Even if you've been alive for over a hundred years, landing right on your head after a fall like that, Evo Shandor's done! Quaid, having killed Riser, begins to destroy the other runes, causing the rift in space-time to continue to destabilize. Ray steps forward to the rift. Hey, remember me? He takes off his eye patch and throws it aside. I'm ready this time! As the other Ghostbusters hold back Tiamat by firing directly into the eye, Ray steps fully into the light and yanks the ripcord on his pack. For a moment, Ray Stance sees beyond the veil of reality. He sees Tiamat, a solar system-sized seven-headed dragon twisting in space. Ray is lifted as his pack begins to de-atomize, and then his body begins to de-atomize. And for a second, Ray's consciousness is sprayed across the entire universe, and he sees everything at once, the past, the future, the living, the dead, the real and the unreal, all combined into one conceptual world of beauty, swirling beauty, endless light and life, and that is the universe. And Ray says, Oh, wow. And then he fucking explodes with so much force that it blows half of the top of the building off, nearly kills all the other Ghostbusters. Ray Stance just went God mode and the rift is closed. Ghosts start going off in all directions. Not just all the ghosts the Ghostbusters had already caught, but enough ghosts to fill three more movies and two streaming series. And you see what I'm saying? I opened that hole in the sky so ghosts could fall out of it, not so Tiamat could come in, come on. That way you have a world filled with these ectoplasmic entities that will make sense to have sequels in. Becker and Oberstein go meet up with the LA Busters and basically are like, well guys, you came through, we still think you're douchebags. Whereas the LA Busters are like starstruck by them, the opposite of the previous dynamic. And they're both like, you know you guys just saved the world? Of course, Vince Clortho and Zool transform back into the cool female Ghostbuster from LA and Dante. And when Dante falls out, I, would, I want him to have like a really hot body. And I want him to do like a, like a classic like damsel in distress after he comes out of the wreckage of the monster. He goes, uh, just right into Spangler's arms and she catches him. And it's that classic image, kind of like from Ghostbusters 1 with uh, Weaver and Moranis, except for, you know, it's like that. It's, it's funny. It's, it's funny. The group kind of comes back together. All the Ghostbusters united looking over New York City as dawn is beginning to break. The score is exploding into a lush, full orchestra suite of the Ghostbusters theme, something we haven't really heard properly. We've heard the digital version for YouTube, but we have not heard those violins, that Royal Philharmonic, that end of a movie shit, muscular music. They come down from the tower, but now all the ghosts have left, so it's basically Mardi Gras. Everyone's going to get laid. The world just almost ended. They were already playing music and drinking and having fun, and now that there's no threat, it's fucking beautiful out. Winston notices that Ray is gone and says, where's Ray? Spengler says to him, he turned himself into a nuclear explosion and spread all over the universe. For a moment, he existed everywhere at once, and then he was gone. Yeah, that's Ray. Becker is united with his fiance. Oberstein is rocking out. He's been vindicated about the science. Quaid, you know, is a kind of a hot guy, and now he has a bullet wound. And all these women are sort of going like, oh, Quaid, you saved the world. And he's being loaded into an ambulance by hot paramedics. Right as he's about to start flirting with these paramedics, Slimer comes out and goes into the ambulance, and the doors close, and Quaid goes, no, nah! like that. So yeah, Slimer will be in the sequels because he was great in the real Ghostbusters cartoon, and him not being a part of this franchise in a meaningful way after all these years would just be weird. 
I like it. I yeah, man, that's it. fucked up. They had everything Just else in the new movie. They had the car in the new movie. They had the traps. They had the packs. But no Slimer. You need a better agent. Because you know what they got? A younger you. Quaid in the ambulance has Slimer resting on him like one of those big, you know, like English bulldogs. <laughs> and Quaid goes, great. So this is the new deal. Spangler is overjoyed and shares a moment with Dante. She got closure about her father. She got closure with Ray. She saved the world. She's now the leader of the Ghostbusters team. And best of all, getting uh, possessed by a demon kind of brought Dante a little ways away from the free spirit movement. New York will be repaired, but Becker wonders what's coming next. So many demons, ghosts, wraiths, spectral entities of all types were released all over. The walls between the spirit world and the world of the living have been permanently damaged. What does this mean? Becker asks Winston. And Winston, a man who's seen Ghostbusters 1, responds, I guess that means we're back in business. And that's Ghostbusters 3! Uh, yeah. Yeah, Ghostbusters Afterlife having exactly the same ending almost as, my, as mine is weird. But what are you going to do? So yeah, Winston as a billionaire restarts the Ghostbusters. Um, that's the final beat of the movie. If that sounds familiar, I assure you it was parallel thinking, but that is my Ghostbusters 3. I really wanted to create something that would just be the Ghostbusters movie everybody already thinks exists. A big action movie with heart, incredible effects, great comedy, high stakes, fun performances, twists and turns, uh, a bizarre paranormal storyline, and even a few scares. And that's what I think Ghostbusters should be. And I budgeted out at like 200 million, which is, I think, what Ghostbusters in 2015 would have been worth. You know, my entire life, I chased these properties because my entire life, I wanted to tell new stories with these characters who had made me feel so many different ways. Even everything I've seen about the industry and society and life and filmmaking and how it's all corporate now, I'm always gonna hold that hope out for bigger and riskier and different because I think the greatest ally to boredom is the status quo. And so much of branded filmmaking is about protecting the status quo. I mean, Lethal Weapon 2 killed the entire supporting cast. Can we, can we push it farther with some of these movies? Uh, also, the best uh, film trilogy of all time is the Before trilogy, and if you haven't seen it, you should. Cut. You need a better agent, because you know what they got? A younger you. A younger, hotter you. But you're the original, and you deserve more. Never settle for anything again. Be a prima donna. You're an icon.